Welcome to this taster lecture for visit day on March the 28th. My name is Professor Mary Edwards. I'm a member of the physical geography staff here at the uh, Department of Geography and Environmental Science and I work a lot in northern regions including the Arctic. So my talk today is going to be about how the Arctic is changing in relation to global warming. Several of us here in the department work in the north. So Jane Hart works on glacial dynamics, particularly in Iceland, and Charlotte Clark, who's still a member of the department after just finishing her PhD, works on vegetation and climate change in northern regions using ancient DNA. To start, let's have a think about how the Arctic has changed over the last 100 to 200 years. Back in 1845, the ill-fated Franklin expedition sailed off to try and find the Northwest Passage around uh, the north of the Canadian mainland and through the archipelago. The ships got iced in for a whole summer. Sadly, all hands were lost from starvation and it was a, a very tragic end to the expedition. If we look and uh, assess the difference in mean temperature between the time the Franklin expedition sailed in the middle of the 19th century to what the temperature looks like today, we can see globally the temperature has shown a steady, fairly steady increase of about a degree or so Celsius in um, the last 150 years. Uh, however, what we see is in the Arctic, this mean change in temperature is about two degrees C. If that seems like a small number, we should remember that the change between the last ice age, when much of the northern latitudes were covered in, in ice, um, was about four to five degrees Celsius. So we've seen a warming uh, in the Arctic really of quite significant proportions, and we would expect to see changes in the Arctic. This warming that is greater than the global average is called Arctic or polar amplification. These diagrams show trends in the winter, December, January, and February, and they show that the darker the red color, the more there's been a change um, in the surface temperature in recent times. We can also see that by latitude, the trend is most uh, advanced up here in the northern latitudes. And if we look at the average temperature as it goes from the 1960s to um, uh, just past 200, 2010, we can see that the global black line here follows this course, but the Arctic line follows a course that increases much more rapidly. So the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the planet. If we project these trends using climate model simulations, which take either on the left-hand side a low emission pathway, a pathway that assumes the planetary emissions are curbed to um, reduce the amount of CO2 going into the atmosphere versus a high projection pathway where it's often called business as usual. The planet continues to generate a lot more carbon dioxide through industrial activities and the burning of fossil fuels. We can see a very major difference in how warm the planet is expected to get. But in both diagrams, we see that the Arctic in particular is seen to warm a lot. What are the causes of polar amplification? Well, greenhouse gas levels uh, partly mean a slower rate of heat loss out of the atmosphere, which affects the Arctic uh, quite disproportionately because the Arctic is a major area of loss of radiation to space. Um, changing Arctic clouds have been noticed, and clouds also tend to uh, slow heat loss and act as a blanket. And then here we see the ice cover in the middle of winter. This ice um, here seen on the land, but would also cover much of the Arctic Ocean, leads to a uh, reflection away of the sun's radiation. It's a cooling effect on the planet. If the snow and ice cover in the Arctic is gradually reduced, that reflection uh, goes away and more of the sun's radiation 
comes right to the surface of the planet, warming it. Another thing that's been observed, particularly on the Greenland ice cap, is the deposition of pollution particles, particularly soot, and then also dust from various regions onto the snow. And this again changes how much the snow or ice reflects away the radiation. So if you cover the Greenland ice sheet with a, a thin layer of dark soot, it will melt faster. Other things are also going on. Changes in the atmospheric circulation patterns are being observed and there seems to be more heat moving from low latitudes, equatorial regions, up towards the poles. All these things seem to be contributing to this idea of precipitation. Now, <clears throat> last winter it was exceedingly cold in the US Midwest. And um, this is christened uh, by the media, the polar vortex, but what it means is it gets exceedingly cold. And one trend we saw on social media last year was people would wet their blue jeans and then stand them out in the park and watch them freeze in place. And they came up with extraordinarily artistic creations um, about the frozen pants challenge what caused these conditions for freezing your blue jeans in the park? What is the polar vortex? Well, it's a circulating atmospheric flow that actually marks approximately where the jet stream moves and it marks a big shift in global temperatures between uh, the northern regions and warmer temperate um, areas to the south. Typically, this strong gradient in um, temperature and pressure leads to rapid circulation of the winds generated by um, strong gradients. These winds, in a sense, tend to contain the cold air over the Arctic and uh, south of this circulating um, pattern of winds, uh, temperatures are much warmer. When the um, Arctic gets warmer, which it's done a lot in recent years, there's less of a gradient of temperature and indeed of pressure between the northern part of the planet and the part further south, which reduces the force driving these circulating winds and causes them to wibble, wiggle about um, and meander, setting up these very large wiggles. And whenever a wiggle moves south, carrying with it the cold air from northern regions, you get what is called a polar outbreak. And this is basically what happened to Chicago and the Jurassic Park. Now, at the poles, liquid water and ice are often in a delicate balance. And we find that it is this relationship between water and ice driving a lot of the changes that we see. So here's a view across the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the effect of warming the temperatures in the Arctic is to thin the ice and indeed melt it completely. This means that the Arctic Ocean, uh, which is covered at least in part all year round by uh, sea ice, um, is starting to change the way it looks. As the ice is broken up and diminishes and retreats to the center of the Arctic Ocean, we instead have blue water. This blue water tends to absorb uh, sunlight, solar radiation and heat um, the ocean more. So submarines that pass under the ice can measure its thickness and it's not only the ice is diminishing in area but it's also diminishing in thickness. And one of the impacts of this is it disrupts um, the hunting patterns of subsistence hunters who live around the coasts of Alaska and Canada. The ice is too dangerous to go out on for much of the year. Of course it also introduces new shipping opportunities. Let's just have a look at what the sea ice has been doing. Um, here we see measurements of the Arctic sea ice extent. It's greatest in spring, about now, and over the summer it melts and gets to its lowest levels in September and October. And this is basically the track of the area of the sea ice of the Arctic Ocean measured by satellites. And what we see are two bundles, this lower bundle of values here where the extent of the Arctic ice at the end of summer is extremely low 
and a second bundle up here where it's low but not quite as low. And what we see is there's an almost exact calendar match that the last decade or decade and a half has seen the lowest cover in sea ice um, of all uh, sea ice that has been measured, all sea ice cover that has been measured. 2012 so far is the lowest sea ice cover of all, but all of the, the last um, package of years have shown this um, diminishment of sea ice. So you retreat the sea ice, it, it goes away from the coast of Canada, and that uh, Northwest Passage that so eluded the um, tragic Franklin expedition can now be traversed and has been traversed many times. There is now that treasured shipping route from Europe to Asia around the top. Um, and this is the first time we've seen this Northwest Passage open since people were observed in a consistent way. And indeed, we've seen cruise ships make their way through um, the Northwest Passage in recent years. Too thin um, and starts to break up and disappear. And white turns to blue over large areas. And this would be the so-called tipping point in the system where we have ice present to maybe no ice at all in the summer or a very, very small amount of ice. Once you've done that, you have an Arctic which is largely absorbing heat, not reflecting heat. And thus, there's a positive feedback here. Um, the warmer the water gets, the more the ice melts, the more hard it is for the ice to form again in the winter. And so the ice is gradually pushed and pushed and pushed um, to smaller and smaller amounts. And it's quite hard to go back to ice present in summer unless something else changes the system to cause the ice to form again. So the Arctic is warming. Pack ice is changing and diminishing. The Northwest Passage is opened. Changes in circulation lead to topsy-turvy temperature patterns well beyond the Arctic experienced in the mid-latitudes. And this change from ice to water in the Arctic Ocean is not just going to affect the air over the Arctic because it warms the Arctic. One of the effects of the Arctic warming is indeed the changes in circulation patterns, um, uh, like the uh, changed patterns of the Rossby waves. And of course, we haven't mentioned it here, but the Arctic's largest ice sheet on Greenland is now melting extremely fast. And things like soot deposition have been observed on the Greenland ice sheet, which, which exacerbate the uh, Now there's also ice under the land. Permafrost or perennially frozen ground um, exists around the Arctic and indeed south of the Arctic Circle. And in places there are very large ice masses or ice wedges lying beneath the surface of the ground. What happens if this ice melts up in the ground? Here's the distribution of permafrost. The green tones show you where permafrost is everywhere, continuous, to only in places discontinuous and sporadic, but we can see it covers much of Alaska, Canada and much of um, Siberia. What happens if this ice melts? Well, here at the coast, one can see these ice wedges, um, lots of massive ice. Here's the Arctic Ocean. There's no ice in summer in the Arctic Ocean. The waves come in and they very rapidly erode thermally um, by thawing the ice and this coast collapses into the sea. Now the coast is the place where many local inhabitants of Alaska and Canada live because of the resources available in the Arctic Ocean. But what is happening here is the rapid retreat of unstable coastlines is leading to actual uh, collapse of, of settlements, um, destruction of settlements, and the need actually to relocate settlements inland from this rapidly eroding coastline. And the members of communities like this along the Arctic coast are some of the first um, uh, refugees, if you will, from, from climate change in the north. They have had to up sticks and uh, move, and it's costing the state of Alaska a large amount of money to um, have to uh, move these villages inland. So this is actually starting to have um, very powerful effects on human populations. Now what I thought I'd do in the second part of the talk was to talk about a research expedition to the Seward Peninsula here um, in Arctic Alaska, which was in, in 
um, involved in looking at what happens when ice in the ground melts. And we see here some interesting indentations. This is a kilometer or so. Um, uh, these uh, these uh, indentations in the ground, they're actually lakes. Or so this is a lake, and this we'll see was a lake that has drained. So if we look at these from an um, Iconos satellite image, we can see with a reversed direction here, here's a lake, quite a deep lake. And here, what looks like a lake, with a sort of knobbly surface and a very clear drainage channel out. This is a landscape underlain by lots and lots of massive ice, which due to surface disturbance tends to melt out and create collapsed depressions which fill with water and form what we call thaw lakes or thermocast lakes. And these then themselves get drained accidentally and leave uh, lake images or lake patterns old lake basins um, in the surface of the ground. It's a very complex geomorphology that we see. So what's going on? Some kind of disturbance of the ground, um, perhaps uh, removal of the vegetation um, by possibly a fire or um, some accumulation of water on the surface of the ground, which tends to make it warmer when the, when the water is um, above freezing and causing a little depression to form, perhaps like this. Um, this then becomes a self-perpetuating uh, system of water above freezing, lying above frozen ice and frozen ground, and causing further collapse, melting of the ice, and gradually the hollowing out of quite a large, possibly quite deep hole. And here we see a knobbly pattern which reflects where the ice wedges and the gaps between the ice wedges were. And this is the knobbly surface one saw on the drained lake basin. And this goes on for quite a while and can create quite a large lake. And then eventually maybe the lake drains. So here was uh, the camp that the expedition was, was um, uh, staying in in the uh, March of 2009 this was um, and here are people taking cores from the lake so we're standing on the surface of this lake now the one that we saw Lake Cloudy and we're taking sediment cores out of the bottom of the lake to try and find out how this lake formed and what was going on so various very hard work um, uh, using equipment uh, drill equipment basically and then of course at some point one needs to lie down and have a quick snooze. But what did we find? Well, if you clear, very interesting, if you clear the snow off the surface of the icy lake, you see these rather elegant and spectacular gas bubbles coming up. Well, what are these gas bubbles? These gas bubbles turn to methane. Uh, methane is produced as in this environment, which is um, a thawing out above freezing environment, but also an environment away from the atmosphere, away from the water, and thus containing almost no oxygen at all. Um, what happens is bacteria are woken up, brought back to life, start decomposing the material they find here in the thaw lake, and they produce methane as a consequence of their biological activity. This finds its way up and eventually comes out um, through uh, the water on the Thor Lake and indeed gets up into the atmosphere. Now, methane is a greenhouse gas. It's actually a very powerful greenhouse gas along there with carbon dioxide, but more powerful molecule for molecule than carbon dioxide is. So the consequence of this thawing of the ground ice and the creation instead of lakes and ponds across the surface of the landscape is not only to change the pattern of the landscape, but it's also to produce uh, methane. And indeed also carbon dioxide will be coming off this system because suddenly a whole bunch of material of soil and the vegetation in the soil is um, being decomposed by uh, microorganisms. This is a process that goes on naturally but the thought is, of course, well, what happens if this is accelerated due to the Arctic? And there are some quite extraordinary features appearing around the Arctic. This is the most extraordinary of them all. But in many places, basically without forming a, a pond because the collapse or the melting of the ice actually takes place on a hill slope, instead of forming a pond, you get a, a, a back um, eroding 
um, gully that drains out downhill into the drainage system of the landscape. And this uh, Batagayaka me mega slump is the large, the largest one that is uh, known about, and it's in Siberia. If you put Batagayaka into Google search, you will find all sorts of amazing pictures of this mega slump. The back wall of that, it's hard to get a, a dimension on this, the back wall of that mega slump here is about 80 meters deep. So this is a huge amount of material that's been um, eroded out by massive ice. There's lots and lots of ice in this, this deposit. And it actually is all only about 50 years old when some very ill-advised person decided they'd cut the forest on this particular hill slope. And that was enough to let in the sunlight and start the melting process of the ice in the ground. Begin and then it just fed on itself and created this huge, huge slump. So what are the take home messages? There's no doubt the Arctic is warming. The trends are multi-decadal and they're large. So climate change is happening in the Arctic and it's happening there in a big way. <clears throat> it's the ice melting. Ice to water is a major change and it affects the landscape in many different ways and also leads to uh, an effect on climate itself through various feedback mechanisms. If we take a socio-political look at the way the Arctic is changing, we see various things that can be considered positive and negative. Basically, adaptations, opportunities, and threats. So sea routes become possible, so does mineral prospecting for oil and gas and other minerals. Whether this is good for the Arctic ecosystem is certainly a question that's open to debate. Undoubtedly, traditional life ways are changing. Villages are being destroyed. Subsistence uh, on the ice, subsistence hunting on the ice is, is becoming more and more difficult. Uh, there will be major adaptations and at some point possibly limits to adaptations in local communities, which could be very challenging to deal with. When we think of engineering and infrastructure, the thawing, the rapid thawing poses challenges and for example, now the ice roads along the major rivers are becoming less secure. That threatens transport systems. New ways of transport will have to be developed. All of this is heightening the interest of governments, uh, both governments uh, in Arctic nations and those looking at the Arctic with a new interest, either for reasons of economy um, or security. So the Arctic is uh, now under the spotlight in many ways in the socio-political and economic way. Meanwhile, though, the feedbacks to the global climate system will be hard to reverse because this, this big Arctic thaw is now well underway. So I hope you've enjoyed this very brief tour of a warming thawing Arctic and you're very welcome to send questions to me about this or about our work in the north and our research in physical geography to me at the um, email address m.e.edwards at sotton.ac.uk. Thank you very much for uh, listening to this talk.